Okay, um, hello everyone. Oh, I'm just getting used to new glasses, so that was a very strange experience. You look much better this way, thanks. Um, so my name is Dr. Sarah Lappin, and with me is Dr. Rachel O'Grady. We're both from Queens. My colleague, Dr. Gassi Uzunian, who is a co-author in the publication I'm gonna be talking about today, couldn't attend, unfortunately, but she says hello. Um, so we're gonna be talking about this brand new publication, which has just come out. There are lots of copies at the back, and we don't want to go home with any, so please take as many as you like. We also have a PDF version that you can download if you like, and you can talk to me about where to get that afterwards. So Rachel and I are here to represent the Recomposing the City Research Group. Um, we're based in Belfast and in Oxford at Queens and at, um, at Oxford University. And basically our mission is to bring together artists, architects, planners, and others in investigating the relationship between sound and urban environments. And we very purposefully support new design and research projects, and we seek to improve the understanding of sound by those who make decisions about cities, whether those are planners or architects or policymakers or the people who work in, in this building as well. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that our aim is not merely to reduce unwanted noise in urban areas, but we, we uh, really support creating urban spaces in which sound is considered essential and positive. So our current project is called Hearing Trouble, and it's a three-year funded project by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So the research you're gonna see today is coming out of that project. Um, so key to our vision of the Sound Considered City is the, uh, the innovative work carried out by sound artists. Um, and in some cases, sound artists have been tasked specifically with improving urban areas, and in other cases, their work has, been, has unforeseen positive aspects. Uh, our research shows that artists and designers can effectively recompose the city through sound art. So as I say, I'm going to be talking about the publication that we have come up with um, that looks like this. And um, we've written it specifically for people who make decisions about cities, and not just those who are doing so currently, but also our students. So it's interesting what Keith was just talking about. These are some projects by our current first year and uh, undergrad and first year master's students in architecture. They're going to be built at full scale in Derry, London Derry in May, and they're pavilions, some of which are based around visual aspects of culture, and three of which are actually based around sound, so we're really excited about that. We're finding that our students are becoming increasingly comfortable with dealing with the creative aspects of sound as well as acoustics. So just very quickly, the policy context in which we're working, and most of you are more than familiar with this in the room, but um, you know, in the first half of the 20th century, it was demonstrated that unwanted noise definitely had deleterious effect on health. And there have been numerous um, laws passed in order to help defend against that, um, not least of which is the um, European Noise Directive, um, and which um, the outcome of which is often noise maps, and they're a really useful tool to help us understand what parts of cities are quite loud and how we should be dealing with those. But in addition to that, there are people who are exploring the positive aspects of cities. The map below is one which is um, a map that looks at the different sounds of London and a more qualitative understanding of that city and which um, sounds are happening, bird song, people talking, um, different noises like that. Construction noise comes up quite a lot as well. So that's the kind of context in which we were uh, thinking about this work. And we put together, uh, the, the, um, the booklet is, is kind of based in two parts. There's introductory aspects to it, as well as a discussion about how you might think about sound in an, uh, kind of a, an innovative way. And then we break it down into nine different themes. So Rachel's gonna talk about um, how she approached thinking about sound and architecture, particularly as a designer. Our, Rachel and I are both architects. And um, Rachel devised some really clever ways of, of getting people to feel comfortable about thinking about sound, particularly in urban areas. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel now. Thanks, Sarah. So, yes, as Sarah said, I definitely approached uh, the sound analysis pages in our publication much more as a, a designer than as a lecturer or certainly not as an expert in acoustics. But I wanted to devise a method where I could bring some acoustic sensitivity into my design work to better bring it in from the beginning. And something that we do as architects is when you get a new project, you go to site and you look at the conditions and you try and get a sense of the problems and opportunities of that site. But I have to say that a lot of us forget to listen to the site and to bring acoustics into the design from the beginning in that way, and there's no reason why not. 
at all. I think that maybe we're not criticised so much on the acoustic properties of our projects sometimes as much as we are the visual, which is wrong because there are so many parts of Belfast, as I think we've demonstrated in uh, our booklet, that are either fantastic acoustically and it really makes the space, like the entries in Cathedral Quarter are so wonderful and I really think they're so enlivened by the acoustic quality of those spaces. And there are other spaces that probably will never work as well as they should because of the, the poor acoustic quality of them. And so this is a method that I've used and put together with some people who are much better and much more have a much better expertise in acoustics than me, people from SARC, amazing sonic researchers that anyone can follow. So we divided the exercise into three, looking at sites. The first one, we used a very simple decibel meter just to compare the noise levels and especially the peaks and flows of traffic um, to, to see whether they really were as annoying and loud as they felt. A lot of the time, they were. And that's a very simple way you can compare one site with another and think about, do we have a particular problem in this site? But then there are equally important ways of just being there and listening. So, for example, can you have a good conversation in the site was a question we asked in different parts of Belfast. And some places, even though they had outside eating areas and tables and chairs, you couldn't hold a conversation there at all. And so these are simple things we can think about in urban design, in planning, in architecture. The final thing we did, and this was incredibly useful is just recording the site and listening back and thinking about the predominant sounds and the secondary sounds and the overall quality and variety of sounds across the city because there really is a huge variety across Belfast of acoustic environments which is very enjoyable and possibly not always taken into consideration in new designs for the city. Um, sometimes traffic was completely the overriding noise and other very positive things like music took a back seat and couldn't be enjoyed. Other times that really faded into the background and bird song and music and life was very enjoyable in those situations. And I think that really told us that it's not always about aiming for the quietest spaces, but a variety of acoustic environments in the city. So I hope that's a bit of an overview to these pages in the document and uh, gives you a taste of a method that you could incorporate very easily, however, whatever your level of expertise. So that's basically the kind of thinking about how you can treat um, you know, acoustic environments in a, in a way with maybe for people who aren't necessarily that comfortable with this kind of technology. It's also important to note that one of the main reasons why we did this now, of course, was because of the devolution of planning powers um, on, in April 2015. And so we took a long time going through not only these development um, plans that are in draft form, but also quite a few others from different parts of the country and indeed parts of the world. And what we discovered were there are there are consistent themes, pl core planning principles that are repeated in a lot of these documents. And so we felt that this was a good opportunity to try to maybe make a difference in how these plans were being written, but also recognizing that we needed to speak the language of planners. So we came up with this list of nine topics that seem to repeat themselves quite a bit in a lot of the documentation. And they range from everything from health and well-being to safety to biodiversity. And what I'm going to do in the remaining time is I'm going to try to talk you through some examples of these um, that are, are the examples of which are, are um, shown through sound art. Um, projects, which we think kind of exemplify or at least start to address some of these issues. Not necessarily on purpose, but we think that they really target some of these issues quite successfully. So the first one is this wonderful project called Sing City, and we think that it really looks at health and well-being in a very clever way. It was done in 2010 by a master's student in London called Anna M. Casson. And obviously for many cities, um, health and well-being is a key goal. And many planners are looking at creative ways of how to tackle these, these kinds of issues. Um, and Ka Anna's uh, mission in Sing City was to provide a quote, a quick uplifting break for busy people by reacquainting them with birdsong in the streets of London. She used widely available technologies, such as a website and um, 
a uh, mobile phone app to engage the public in getting outside and hanging out with birds and birdsong. The website included a live map which showed hot spots of activity. So if you saw a particularly beautiful robin sitting in a tree in Ormo Park, you could upload that and somebody who lived nearby or was working nearby could go out and see the same bird if they hurried. Um, and so it becomes this kind of, as, as Keith was talking about, kind of crowdsourcing technology to get people out and about. Um, it also aimed to promote pro uh, physical activity to combat uh, multiple health issues, as we're well aware, um, obesity, um, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, etc. And it was seen as an attractive thing to do, not just because it got people outside, but also because birdsong is seen as therapeutic as well. We think it's really admirable, too, that Anna developed this in conjunction with Lewisham Council, um, where they are battling with health inequalities and very limited budgets. And we think this is an incredibly clever project in order to address those sorts of challenges. Um, so we think that her, sorry, her project exemplifies how a creative approach to sound in the city can help combat these serious health issues um, in a very affordable way. How much time do I have left? I'll maybe skip over connectivity. I know some of the people in the room have seen this before, and I want to get maybe to some other examples. But it's a very interesting one if you want to talk to me about it. The, the uh, next one we're going to talk about is the issue of vibrancy. And the vibrancy in a city is often regarded as essential to livability, to a residence, and attractiveness in terms of tourism and investment. And the sounds of a city, you know, whether or not it's buzzing, it's got that buzz that Rachel was talking to about, um, it can be a, a key aspect of whether or not a city is worth investing in, it's worth living in, worth playing in. So we really like this project. Um, in, in Montreal, there's a, a Quartier de Spectacle, which is an area of the city which has quite a few venues for performance. And so at certain times of the day and night, it's very busy and really vibrant, and at other times it can be, get quite quiet. So the Quartier commissioned CS Design from Montreal and the Lateral Office from Toronto to think about, in a temporary way, how they might redesign these areas. So with several collaborators, including sound artist Mitchell Akiyama, they installed this wonderful project called Impulse, um, which was a series of 30 adult-sized seesaws. Um, the seesaws, however, were no ordinary pieces of playground equipment. They were designed to cope with Canada's extreme temperatures, and the seesaws were not only eliminated by bands of LED lights, which you can see there, um, but they also played different notes when they were in use. So depending on how many people were on them and at what rate they were going up and down, they played this really beautiful song. The designers were inspired by, they said, by rhythm, repetition, and syncopation. These are some really incredible drawings that they did. So um, key to the sonic experience were the number of people who were engaged with the installation. And as I say, it was their movement that dictated how the performance occurred. I'm going to try to um, play you an excerpt, but it's important to note that the designers saw impulse as an ever-changing urban instrument. Uh, I love that phrase. So I'm going to try to play you a video, see if this works. So what's interesting about the story of Impulse is that it doesn't end in Montreal. Starting in 2016, the entire installation moved around the world and has been installed in cities including London, Brussels, Chicago, Detroit, um, and it's ongoing. The vibrancy that this project brings to places it visits is an example of how sound can invigorate cities in simple, beautiful, and effective ways. The next project it addresses tourism, and we think it's really important that tourism projects not only tackle the issue from bringing people into the city, but that they don't alienate visit they don't alienate the people who actually live there. Um, and we think that sound can play a really important part of this approach. So, in order to attract tourists and locals to um, 
this, uh, and animating a public space. The Zadar County Croatia commissioned architect Nikola Bazic and a castician Ivan Stamic to create an acoustic installation on a new coastal promenade. One might think that the Zadar sea organ from 2005 is simply a set of beautifully made granite steps which lead into the Adriatic Sea. However, when one listens closely, and you do have to kind of listen to it this closely, um, I made my parents do this and my husband when we were on holiday, it was good fun. Um, when you listen closely, you can hear low tones emitting from the steps themselves. The site is a fantastically vibrant public space, heavily populated by families and teenagers who sunbathe and play in the water. It simultaneously welcomes both locals and tourists. Through a system of carefully tuned pipes and short tunnels, the Zadar Sea Organ uses the movement of the tidal and human-made waves to force water and air into the instrument. The size and lengths of the pipes create different notes, just as with a traditional church organ. The artists were careful to tune the pipes to mimic the sounds of traditional male choirs in the area, lending yet another layer of the site's specificity to the sounds. The sounds also reflect the seasons and times of day. At high tide, the organ is more active, when a speedboat zips past, the rhythms of the organ become faster as well. There are videos of this online um, which you can listen to. It's difficult to hear, so I won't play it now, but there are really beautiful um, videos of this on, um, on YouTube. It sounds sort of like a whale having a party, kind of. It's a really interesting sound. The ZRC organ has not only been successful in attracting tourists, but it has won international design awards because of the exemplary public space it has created. The city has thus successfully commissioned a sound project which not only engages tourists but also draws locals to play here. The entire built environment around the sea organ has been carefully designed and constructed with a very high level of, of materials for the walkways, the benches, and the steps themselves. Because of this robust nature of the materials and the tidal aspect of the organ's power, we can imagine that this instrument would play for decades, if not centuries, to come. And maybe I'll show you this last one in terms of economic growth. Um, when sound is considered by designers, it can add significantly to the economic viability of a city. Oftentimes, this is not an intended aspect of sound installations or soundscapes, but sound can have a profound effect on the economic profile of a city nonetheless. So this is a project called um, the Forgotten Songs, and it was part of a, an Australian $9 million um, project to rejuvenate the George Laneways of Sydney. And a group of artists, designers, and sound experts came together to make this particular sound installation. It was led by um, artist Michael Hill, and it identified indigenous birds that had once inhabited the unloved, forgotten alleyway called Angel Place in downtown Sydney. They recorded the songs of these indigenous birds, many of which are now endangered. Hill and his team installed these recordings in 120 bird cages hung across the width and length of the narrow alleyway. The project we think is powerful on many levels. It's visually striking, with bird cages creating ever-changing shadows across what used to be an uninhabited and derelict space. Likewise, Forgotten Songs draws attention to the importance of preserving local animal species and the sounds they bring to the city. These sounds are subtle and multi-layered. They have less opportunity thus to become repetitive and annoying for those who live and work nearby. Perhaps most importantly, they are local sounds. These are not noises imported from other environments, but instead they reflect the history of that specific place. However, what the artists did not expect was the significant economic impact of the project. By enlivening this formerly dead alleyway, they created new opportunities for small independent businesses. After the installation of Forgotten Songs, business owners decided to open new bars and cafes in Angel Place, which you can see there. The sound art installation brought much needed footfall, a key to the success of any small business. Thus, Forgotten Songs had a significant impact on the area's economic sustainability. Susie, do I have time for one more example, or shall I wrap it up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll share you this one as well. This is the final one. This one is about shared space. And as Rachel and Gassi and I have been working on the project, we found that shared space is a concern not just for post-conflict cities like uh, Belfast and Berlin, which we've been heavily researching, but for lots of cities for numerous different reasons. And increasingly, designers and policymakers are trying to ensure that cities have spaces where people of different backgrounds can feel comfortable at any time of day, kind of as Rachel was talking about. So we really like this project. It's called Voice Tunnel from 2003 by sound artist, sound and light artist, Rafael Lozano Hammer. Um, and it took over the 
tunnel of Park Avenue and made it totally pedestrianized for a weekend um, with the permission of the Department of Transport's Summer Streets program. And the installation featured 300 spotlights activated by people's voices. The artist says that he, quote, wanted to create an experience that would bring people together, that would create a sense of choir, of people speaking not just to each other, but also to their city. Not only were there thousands of people part of the shared experience, but the fact that the voices reflected so many different accents and languages also showed how diverse the city is. I'll try one more video. The, the merit of this particular interaction is to make it architectural, to make it into a narrative. The tunnel itself, its linearity helps you sort of go from story to story, almost like as if you were being able to tune into people's different realities. So the idea is to create some kind of concert, if you will, of voices inside of the tunnel, but that they're not composed, they're not pre-recorded. It's all live, it's all crowdsourced, it's all whatever people want to say. These artists have made me see another part of the city in a wonderful way. I love this place. The shared aspect of the installation was crucial to attracting thousands of participants. For Lozano Hammer, the sound of all the cities coming together gave the sense of a party, a lot of people speaking at the same time, a very urban experience. So, we think that sound can be much more than noise that pollutes. Sound can make a considerable positive impact on how spaces are lived in, worked in, and played in for generations to come. Our study has shown that this positive impact can be seen in such varied domains as biodiversity, economic growth, safety, health and well-being, accessibility, and inclusivity. Sound is an essential part of the creation of vibrant and vital cities. Thank you very much.